Log. August 19th. All I could think was, these witch bitches want me dead. Each witch in the coven was standing in one of the four directions. Brooke at north, Carmen at south, Megan at east, and Bibi at west, chanting. The evil words Jenna Clayton spreads. Return to her and fill her with dread. You'd strike against us, lands tenfold on her head. So much so, she will wish she were dead. Fear dripped down into my stomach like acid. It wasn't a dream. It wasn't a hallucination. They were here. I closed my eyes and promised whatever spirit's still listening that I'd leave Westchester and never look back if it saved me. Before I could rally my voice and curse them if they didn't leave, they vanished. I knew I had to go. They were getting bolder by the minute. I leaned over and kissed Victor. The sleeping pills kept him under. I knew he wouldn't feel my kiss physically, but... Maybe spiritually he would. I scrambled out of bed, threw on some clothes, grabbed my bag, and left the house. These recordings might be the only thing people remember me by. They prove I'm not crazy. Realm presents If I Go Missing, The Witches Did It, Episode 1. Log, July 2nd. The entire time I was talking with four of the most high-powered women in all of Westchester, I was standing in dog shit. The women stood on the porch like goddesses, while my mortal ass was stuck in muddy grass to the right of the walkway. All I had to do was walk on the concrete without stepping in anything. But no, I don't do things the easy way. Victor stood up on the first porch step, right in front of the goddesses, as if he were an offering placed at their feet. He looked over his shoulder at me and made a formal introduction. This is Jenna Clayton. She's a fantastic writer. A self-described feminist, Victor always made a point of introducing me without referencing our relationship, so I could shine on my own. I'm here to write a book, a book somebody will actually want to read. The only other black person, presumably for miles, said, And I'm Carmen Silva. I own a wellness company geared toward women of color. Made sense. If flawless skin were currency, Carmen would be a billionaire. Carmen and Victor smiled at each other like they shared a secret. I did not like that. The way the sun played on Carmen's skin made me wish Victor had mentioned I was his girlfriend. Live-in girlfriend. Hi, I'm Brooke Gates, said this ashy blonde with really toned arms. She's the kind of woman who wears a plain face because you're supposed to see her beauty. No need to emphasize anything because it's all good. Brooke is an artist. Iron sculptures, Victor said to clarify. Now I remembered him talking about a family friend who sold a piece for $700,000. I tried to make a face that was polite but unimpressed. I already knew Belinda Beckett a high-powered publishing exec who passed on both my book manuscripts. Hi, Belinda. Oh, I wanted to come across as someone on her level, but I don't think I was successful. Bibi grunted a, "Mm mm-hmm, in response. Jesus. Each of the women were wearing a very stylish summer uniform, mixes of white and tan, like the children of the dam had grown up and diversified. What an amazing welcoming committee, Victor said to the goddesses, taking off his tortoiseshell Ray-Bans and pushing them up into his curly brown hair. I could see the women taking in the odd yet beautiful architecture of Victor's face. His cheekbones are higher than they should be, and two thick wedges of hair act as eyebrows. Underneath them are blue eyes, a questioning blue, a distant blue. Some might say his eyes are the blue you'd find at the bottom of one of those rocket-shaped popsicles. Okay, that sum is me. I say that. God, I hate how he looks perfectly put together all the time. Meanwhile, I was sweating through a dull green tank top and faded black jean shorts smelling like soggy fries and shit. 
The only goddess to acknowledge even in the smallest of ways that I was standing in shit was the one nobody bothered to introduce. She took a packet of baby wipes out of her gigantic purse, came down the stairs, and gave me the whole thing. Can you tell I'm a mom? Brooke's mouth arranged itself into a smile that might have been mistaken for warm by any other mere mortal, but I could see right through her. That's Megan. You might have heard of her Instagram account, Mommy Megan. With more than a million followers on Instagram, Carmen added, as if that made Megan more important. I smiled, totally fake. Nobody seemed to notice. Inside, I was willing Victor to come back down to my level. I started to feel like his servant instead of his girlfriend, which maybe makes perfect sense because Victor comes from money. Like, we're staying at his great uncle's estate. God rest his soul. These people are from another planet. I'm having a barbecue on Friday for July 4th. I'd love for you to come. You too, Jenna. Of course he accepted the invitation on the spot. I squeaked a thanks from the peppiest part of my soul, and Victor took a step down, back toward me. He knows that high, sing-songy tone is my fake enthusiasm voice. She continued, Victor, I was so sad to hear about your great-uncle Felix. I'm sorry that this is what brought us together again after all these years. How many years? I don't know yet. BB mumbled something about a conference call and began to walk off, waving a casual hand and saying, Sorry, sorry. In a way that suggested she wasn't even a little sorry. Ignoring me in person as easily as she ignored each manuscript my agent sent her. Hmm. Maybe I should do an expose on that bitch and how rude she is. Best she read that. BB leaving was the cue for the goddesses to fly away too, all smiles and waves. When I heard the cars drive off, I carefully took off my literally shitty shoes and tossed them into the tree line. Victor didn't say anything, but his eyebrows spoke volumes. We went inside the house, which is really a farmhouse, and put our stuff in the biggest of the four bedrooms. Then Victor gave me a tour. This is one creepy ass house. I shouldn't say that. I should be nicer. A man is dead. Also focus, Jenna. It's a colonial, built in the 1780s. Walking around the house, I thought staying here would be a good test of our relationship. When we're cooped up in a studio, we have to deal with our shit immediately. But up here, there's enough room for us to walk away and let things fester. I could see Victor was already thinking of it as his, though he would never have admitted it. Great Uncle Felix didn't have any kids, and Victor was his favorite relative, even after death. Victor has been directed by the not favorites to take care of the estate until everything is sorted out. After the tour, I broke out the sage and lavender bundle I packed. Victor was not happy. Babe, can you be careful? I don't want anything to catch fire even though the bundle was resting in the abalone shell. One ember fell on the rug in our apartment six months ago, and he hasn't stopped talking about it ever since. It's getting rid of negative energy. If you don't want to be around while I'm sage in the place, then maybe the sage is working. What negative energy? No one has lived here in a couple of years now. That reminds me to sage the porch, too. The breeze keeps bad vibes moving, but better safe than sorry. Bad vibes? Are you talking about Brooke? Brooke and company. They're weird. Why were they wearing matching clothes? How did they know when we would show up? Are they psychic? Did they pay someone to tip them off when we rolled through town? Do you think you're being a little hypercritical right now because you're embarrassed about stepping in dog poo? Shit, Victor. Don't try to make it sound cute. And we're not going to that barbecue either. Give them a minute to forget about this shit incident. Babe, come on. Don't obsess. It wasn't that bad. I am not obsessing. How am I obsessing? How? I don't want to sit up in Brooke's corny-ass barbecue with unseasoned chicken and raisins in the potato salad. You can go. I'm not going. I said, storming off to sage the porch out of spite. 
Our first day in the house officially sucked as far as I was concerned, and we avoided each other for hours. After dinner, I went outside to find the shoes I threw in the trees and clean them off. They were waiting for me on the porch, all cleaned up and ready to go. When I thanked Victor, he tried to act all modest, like he didn't even know what I was talking about. My anger at Victor dissolved. I'm even considering going to Brooks Barbecue now, even though I know it will be full of basic people taking pictures of themselves doing basic things. Mm. Wanna be influencers sucking up to the queen of influencers. Ugh, that reminds me to start a Twitter account or professional Instagram or something to promote my work. I have to build a platform. A writer with the following gets published easier. Ugh, vomit. Totally makes sense to post a picture of my coffee mug next to my laptop to prove I'm writing instead of, you know, really writing. My agent did say to write about something I care deeply about that isn't dismantling racism or rampant capitalism. But maybe I can combine those things with pop culture. Money for nothing, a deep dive into the influencer ecosystem. Mm, I probably need a better title. It doesn't sound very fun. I need to keep it cute and light, which might be a challenge in this creepy ass house. It gets even creepier after dark. I feel eyes on me all the time, even though no one is there when I turn around. The wind makes this whistling sound as it blows through the spaces between the floorboards. Animals howl outside. Victor said my mind is playing tricks on me. Okay, but he's the one who told me his cousin saw a ghost here. Granted, that was when they were kids, but still. I kept thinking that ghosts could just be standing really close to me, looking like they did when they died horrifically, black blood pouring out of their mouths. See, uh, now I'm spooked. Yes, my name is Elise Edgerton, I say to the man behind the counter. He proceeds to tell me how much I look like my mother, Sabine. I smile and pretend to agree. He goes on and on about Sabine, just holding my bagel in his plastic-gloved hands. Hey, you a model too? He asks. I blush. I explain I'm developing a gossip podcast series set in Westchester. I cover influencers, people with large followings on social media. I have a degree in journalism from Columbia. I should have let my dad get me an internship at the Times. I could be doing something substantive. But there is value in independence. Desperate to escape this smallest of small talk, I start looking around for something I can pretend to be interested in, anything. I spot a familiar face, staring out at me from underneath a melange of pinned business cards and flyers on the community board. My all-time biggest crush, Victor Richardson. He's as handsome as ever. I pull down the paper with his picture on it, alarmed to see the word missing screaming at me in big red letters. In the picture, he's next to a black woman. I quickly scan to get the details, and then I realize the woman is his girlfriend, and she's the one who's missing. Jenna Clayton. I'd heard about the death of his great-uncle Felix this summer, and now his girlfriend is missing. I look at the picture of Victor and his girlfriend again. His arm is around her. They look so happy. She's pretty. A nice round face with deep-set dark brown eyes and lots of naturally curly hair. Uh, I'm assuming it's natural. I'm uncomfortable talking about a black woman's hair. Anyway, I should call the number on the poster and check in with Victor and, hopefully, Jenna. Uh, log, July 3rd. Victor is asleep. I tried to go to sleep myself, but my mind kept racing. I expected that Victor and I would be in our own private Idaho here. Instead... He wants me to meet people and show off my wit. That's a direct quote from him. Show off my wit. I don't want to. And he knows people like this make me self-conscious. These aren't fun, quirky Brooklyn neighbors who are charmed by my bar stories. These are Fortune 500 neighbors who never let their eyebrows grow in or their lawns grow out. I am an acquired taste. 
I'm a much better writer than I am a human being. The thing is, babe, we have to be careful out here. We can't embarrass my family. Mm. When you say we, you really mean me. I have to be careful because I don't know how to act right. Please don't put words in my mouth. He said, picking up his phone and opening the calendar. Are you checking to see if I'm on my period? He put the phone away. No, I don't get why you're so upset. Because you're acting like every rich boy in the history of rich boys who've dated poor girls. You're not poor. There is no middle class anymore. Jenna, please, I just asked you to be careful. I didn't ask you to change who you are. But you would like me to. I don't know why you won't just go on and date one of your own kind. Victor's eyes got a shade darker. He was furious. I wish I could stop testing him all the time, but I'm not there yet. Last night, I was almost going to say that we should go to Brooks Barbecue, but I don't want to embarrass you or your family. I said, walking out before he could. Rich boys are like cats who always come up to me because they know I'm allergic to them. They know I'm anti-capitalist, so they hit on me. I try to get comfortable with their money and their lifestyle. Turns out, comfort is for the unconscious. Victor has lasted longer than any of the other rich boys I've dated. That has to mean something. When I got to town, I went to the diner and ordered a burger and fries for an early lunch. Coming around. I calmed down a little bit when I started getting some food in me. I also got a little confirmation from the universe about my book. <laughs> Two middle-aged white women were sitting behind me, eating chopped salads with the dressing on the side, raving about Carmen's anti-aging beauty system. The woman with the raspy voice said she bought the system at first because Carmen's skin always looks so amazing in her photos and videos. Even though she probably just has good skin because black don't crack. She swore the system worked like magic. Black girl magic in every bottle, I said, butting into their conversation. I instantly killed the vibe, and it was clear that the women were uncomfortable. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. No worries, I'm not offended. They didn't believe me and kept apologizing until they were out the door. At least they paid for my lunch. <laughs> when I got back to the house, I didn't know what I was going to do when I saw Victor. But there he was with a bag of my favorite Red Hot Cheetos in each hand as an apology. And I immediately apologized too. When Victor said we didn't have to go to the barbecue, I started feeling conflicted. I didn't want to be around that crowd, but I thought of my book idea. If we went, I could see what the influencer vibe is really like at a real-life event. Can they keep up the glam in person? Do they sweat? Will their lipstick fade? There's nothing more pop culture than influencers right now. Ugh. The only question is if I should write this burn book style. I told Victor we would go to Brooks Barbecue. I check my look in the bathroom mirror at the cafe where I'm meeting Victor. I put on my coral lipstick. Red would be too much. He's sitting at a table when I come out of the bathroom, and he's even better looking than I remembered. How is that even possible? Okay, that's not the right thing to be thinking about right now. Come on, Elise. I need to focus. When I get closer, it's clear he's had a few sleepless nights lately. Really gives him a rock star vibe. I'm guessing Jenna is still missing. My poor Victor. I offer my condolences about his great uncle and Jenna. Thanks, Elise. I want to say that my family really appreciated the catered breakfast your parents arranged. There are so many of us. It made things so much easier. As for Jenna, I don't need condolences. I'm hopeful she'll turn up soon. I've asked one of our neighbors in Brooklyn to keep an eye out for her. Whose idea was the missing poster? Mine. She left out of the blue, but it's not like I woke up to a ransacked house. Her phone's been going straight to voicemail for a week. My gut tells me she left on her own, but if she didn't, I wanted to cover my bases. Why do you think she'd leave on her own? She didn't want to come up here in the first place. She doesn't like to be around this type of scene. We'd been fighting a lot the last couple of months, and I thought if I went away for the summer, she'd break up with me. It was selfish. I ask him if he has any idea where she might be. And I immediately wish I hadn't. Ugh. 
His face falls and his eyebrows knit together with worry. I fold my hands together in my lap to avoid reaching out and holding his hand. Then he asks me how I've been. I haven't seen him since college. Seven years since we've graduated. It's crazy how time works. I catch him up on my life and feel very proud of myself. Even the podcasting part. <laughs> you always did want to save the world. <laughs> God, his eyes are so blue. I'm not sure I'm saving the world, but I'd love to help you save Jenna. He immediately grimaces. I can feel myself blushing. Find Jenna. Find. <laughs> save was the wrong word. I, I want to help find Jenna in any way you want. Okay. Victor is kind. <laughs> Thank God he's so kind. He nods, agreeing to let me help him. <laughs> when a black woman goes missing, no one cares. But I care, Victor. I'm gonna pull a few strings with people I know in the media, okay? Maybe hold off on that just for now, to save face for Jenna if all this was a misunderstanding. I tell him I understand. I don't quite understand, if I'm completely honest, but he's under duress right now. Did she perhaps leave anything behind that might clue us into where she is? A diary? Not a diary, no. Uh, she did record some thoughts for her new book. She saved them in our shared account in the cloud. I haven't had the heart to listen to them yet. Okay, I think deep down inside, he's afraid there are things in those recordings about him that he wouldn't want to hear. Seeing him hesitate, I offer, I can listen to them for you. I, I promise I'll be discreet. I tell him he can trust me. Let me think about it. Okay. I can't help myself. I reach out and grab his hand. Log, July 4th. I saw a fucking ghost! We're leaving! I was rinsing off the apricot scrub, and when I looked up to grab the hand towel to dry my face, I saw someone behind me. I blinked, and it was gone. I called for Victor, and he came running into the bathroom. Jesus. I'm shook, like literally trembling. Babe, do you think you maybe imagined it because you're nervous about going to the barbecue later? He said, wrapping his arms around me. I pushed him off. That thing was bold enough to come out in the morning light. I'm not gonna be the black woman who dies first in a horror movie. His rocket ship blue eyes look super sad. I need you, babe, but I understand. Well, fuck me. I'm gonna die. You're listening to If I Go Missing, The Witches Did It, starring Gabory Sidibe. Created and produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Listen away. If I Go Missing, The Witches Did It is executive produced by and stars Gabory Sidibe. Written by Pia Wilson and produced by Rhoda Bayessa and Haley Wagreich. Associate produced by Michael Coulter and executive produced by Molly Barton. Performed by Gabri Sidibe, Sarah Natacheni, Aaron Landon, Lena Klingeman, Tony D, Alba Ponce de Leon, Tiana Camacho, Jordan Belsky, Eli Gonzalez, and Andrew Lee. Directed by Kaylin West and Amanda Rose Smith. Sound design by Fred Greenholz of Dagaz Media. Audio engineered by Corey Barton. Original theme music by Hashem Asadolahi. Cover art by Kindle Thomas with original illustration by Rochelle Baker. 